Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the Harvard India Conference online debate series. This is a prelude to our flagship event that many of you might already be familiar with. For those of you encountering us for the very first time, the Harvard India Conference is jointly hosted by the students of the Harvard Kennedy School and the Harvard Business Schools at the university campus in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. We have a strong legacy of bringing together leaders, practitioners, and thinkers across government, business, and civil society to weigh in on some of the most pressing issues facing India. While we contemplate the format of our upcoming flagship event in light of the current circumstances, we wanted to use this opportunity to continue engaging with our audiences, leveraging our platform to, engage, to encourage civil debate while celebrating the intellectual diversity that is so core to our identity. So before we get started, I'll just um, quickly go over some um, housekeeping um, items. <coughs> We'll kick up a bit with uh, quick opening remarks from both of our esteemed uh, speakers. Each side will have two and a half minutes, and this will be followed by a 20-minute intra-panel discussion, 20 minutes of audience Q&A, and then we'll end with closing remarks from both sides. You will hear a buzzer intermittently, a one-minute warning <coughs> sound um, sounds kind of like, um, Sorry, we were supposed to have a buzzer go off, but that's OK. Um, so there'll be a one minute warning sound um, uh, for our speakers, and then uh, a time up warning sound. And it'll definitely go off um, uh, when, the, uh, when the time is right. Um, we really um, value our audience engagement um, more than anything. Um, so we uh, really encourage and hope uh, that you will use this time to further probe the arguments presented by both speakers. We'll use the Q&A function um, on your screen to post questions. Uh, you'll see a Q&A uh, button there, so please hit that, and you can post your questions. Um, the other um, attendees uh, on the panel can upvote questions. So if you see your question has already been asked, please use the upvote function. That will help our moderator um, get a sense of which questions um, are sort of in demand, so to speak. Um, and um, uh, oh, well, I almost forgot. We'll be doing an audience poll as well um, uh, before the, the opening and closing remarks, because we would love to get your thoughts in the debate question. Um, so um, our, our moderator will lead, um, lead uh, us with that poll as well. Um, the poll results are completely anonymous, even to the organizers, but the results will be displayed on your screen um, immediately after. Um, now, without further ado, I'd like to invite our moderator, Milan um, Vaishnav, a senior fellow and director of the South Asia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace to lead us through the rest of the event. Over to you, Milan. Thank you, Shaheen. Uh, I want to thank the Harvard India Conference for hosting this online debate on political finance in India. And special thanks to our two speakers today, who I will shortly introduce. Uh, as Shaheen said, my name is Milan Vaishnav. I am a senior fellow and director of the South Asia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, D.C. It's my pleasure to serve as the moderator for today's event. Let me just start with a bit of background uh, on the issue to be debated today. In 2017, the present government announced a new modality of political funding called electoral bonds. In unveiling this new instrument, the then finance minister, Arun Jaitley, introduced the bonds as a bold measure that would improve the transparency of political funding. One year later, in 2018, finance minister Jaitley formally rolled out this new system of electoral bonds in his annual budget presentation. For those who are not aware, electoral bonds are a vehicle through which associations, corporations, and individuals can donate funds to a political party of their choosing via the formal banking system, but neither the donor nor the recipient must disclose the details of individual transactions. So according to government regulations on certain days throughout the year, which are pre-specified, donors can buy bonds, which are essentially non-interest bearing promissory notes issued by the State Bank of India, SBI, in specified amounts. The bonds are valid for a fixed period of time and it can then be deposited in in the official bank accounts of registered political parties, which have earned at least 1% of the votes in previous general or state elections. Now, once those bonds are deposited into the bank accounts of political parties, they are essentially converted into donations. Now, advocates of this new instrument argue that it is a boon for transparency because donors will now have a legitimate channel through which they can make political contributions, as opposed to indulging in you know, under the table transactions, all while protecting their anonymity. 
Opponents of this new instrument argue that bonds have done nothing more than essentially legitimize an anonymity, opacity, and obfuscation. So while the bond transactions might be quote unquote transparent to the regulator, voters, civil society, the media, the general public, they won't be privy to information on who bought bonds and for whom. This they argue is tailor-made for a secret quid pro quo. Today, we are gonna be debating the following motion. Uh, and I wanna quote here, electoral bonds have ushered in an era of transparency and political funding in India, stop quote. To argue in favor of the motion, we have Vaidrayanth J. Panda. Mr. Panda is a national vice president and spokesperson of the Bharatiya Janta Party. He has been a four time member of parliament. He was twice elected uh, to the Rajya Sabha in 2000 and 2006 and the Lok Sabha in 2009 and 2014. And arguing against the motion, we are joined by Dr. Rajiv Gowda. Professor Gowda represented the state of Karnataka for the Indian National Congress uh, in the Rajya Sabha from 2014 to 2020. He currently serves as the chairman of the Congress Party's research department. He was convener of the Congress Party's manifesto committee back in 2019, and he's also a national spokesperson. Welcome to both of our presenters, Mr. Panda and Professor Gowda. Uh, before we get started, we are going to have, as Shaheen mentioned, the audience is going to take a poll. Uh, in a moment, the poll is going to appear on your screens asking you whether you agree or disagree with the motion to be debated. Once our debate is over, we will take another poll to see whether your minds have been swayed. So please take a moment to take the audience poll. Am I visible? All right. Uh, will the organizers be able to share the results of the poll? Yes, so um, the we have the results of the poll in, um, and we have um, twenty one percent voting yes and seventy nine percent voting no. So just to clarify, twenty one percent of participants agree that electoral bonds have ushered in an era of transparency and political funding. Seventy nine percent vote against the motion. Um, yes. Okay, so we are going to take that poll again after uh, at the very end of this debate. So we're now gonna hear opening remarks from each of our speakers. We're gonna begin with Mr. Fonda. He's gonna have two and a half minutes to make opening remarks. When the two and a half minutes are up, we will turn to Dr. Gouda, who will again have two and a half minutes to make his opening remarks. Following both sets of remarks, we will have about 20 minutes or so of discussion between the panelists before opening it up to the audience. Um, Mr. Fonda, if you can hear us, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Milan, and Namaskar. Uh, I believe there's some uh, uh, technical issue. I'm not visible, let, but let, let me continue. Uh, over the past three years, there has been a widespread narrative that India's electoral bonds are somehow regressive and uh, against the spirit of uh, transparency in political funding, which is reflected in these polls. But uh, to the 79% who voted no, I humbly request to kindly keep an open mind and to listen to all the facts. The reality is India's electoral bonds reflected a major shift forward in increased transparency and especially legitimacy of the money in Indian politics. And the reason for that is for almost half a century before that, starting in 1969, when the then prime minister changed the rules, almost all of India's political funding went underground. Like the proverbial iceberg, only a tiny portion of the expenses of candidates and uh, parties uh, were, were reflected and shown. And the rest of it was totally unaccountable cash, literally bundles of cash in suitcases. 
right? Completely distorted the system. And it wasn't just businesses and corporates who adapted to that system. The really terrible part was that it was criminals, including uh, drug smugglers, arms uh, runners, gun runners, and terrorists who were involved in donating that kind of money, which was the bulk of the money. I'm not making this up. You can just look this up anywhere. So in contrast, the electoral bond system brings in legitimacy of the funds because all these uh, entities who can buy the bonds come under a regulatory scanner. There is the SEBI, which is the equivalent of the US SEC. There is the Companies Act and many others. And they have to go through the same KYC norms that all modern banking customers have to go through. So you could argue that this doesn't go far enough for reform. And you know, there's a, there's a point there, and that is another debate. But you cannot reasonably argue that this is a step backwards. So I would say, let us not make the perfect the enemy of the good. Let us recognize the electoral bonds as indeed a huge shift forward in improving the legitimacy and the transparency of the funds in Indian politics. Now, as far as why there was uh, this requirement of not declaring the donors' names, it's because of this culture of half a century. Donors were extremely skittish about it. I think the cultural change that is happening where legitimate people, titans of Indian industry with, with great reputations are coming forward and, and making these donations through the bonds will help change that culture. But in any case, the money is tax paid and legitimate. And other reforms we can argue for in another debate. Thank you, Mr. Panda, for your opening remarks. Uh, Professor Gauda, over to you. When Mr. Arun Jaitley announced in the Rajya Sabha that he was introducing a move to really improve transparency in electoral funding, I was very excited. And then, as the details unfolded, I was very disappointed. What you saw was really the classic example of double speak. When all three of us have worked in the area of electoral reform, and we have all looked for solutions to improve the system, and electoral bonds are a great leap backward rather than a step forward. Let me explain why. When we talk about electoral reforms, when we want what we want are a transparent system, we want a legitimate system where clean money comes into the system. And we also want a level playing field, a, fair, a fairness, so that it doesn't favor the ruling party over opposition parties or something like that. Take a look at this scheme and what happens. Transparency is out of the window. Basically, you and I, who are citizens, who have an interest in finding out who contributed to whom, and what they got back in return, we cannot figure that out. We don't have any idea who has made those mega contributions, 95% of which have gone to the ruling party. We have no idea who are those people, but we know that 97% of them have been in denominations of one crore or more. So obviously, these are not, these are not you and me. And when it comes to legitimacy, it is not clear that this is clean money. When we did the went through demonetization, the banking system, um, uh, you know, everything, all what was supposed to be illegal black money, everything came back into the system. So obviously, the banking system is no guarantee of clean money. And the last thing, as far as fairness is concerned, the government owns the State Bank of India. The government has other methods of finding out who contributed and who did not. And as a result, only the government, the ruling party, will be in the know, and nobody else will have any sense of what's going on. If the government knows who is contributing, then it has the capacity to twist arms and to ensure that nobody uh, goes around distributing re resources to other political parties. The actual track record bears me out. OK. Thank you, Professor Gara, <laughs> Professor Banda. Uh, let me now begin uh, with uh, a question. Uh, I'll start with you, Mr. Panda, since you went, went first. Let's imagine a kind of hypothetical scenario where an iron ore company in your state of Odisha decided to buy hundreds of crores worth of bonds and provide them to the campaign of the ruling BJD, the Biju Janta Dal, ahead of the next elections. 
The BJD, once it was brought back to power, then decides to reward the company with sweetheart deals and regulatory for, uh, forbearance. Uh, with electoral bonds, would there be any way to connect the dots? So when, uh, when my friend Rajiv says that electoral bonds are a step backwards, he implies that what existed before was better, which is just bizarre because it was, as I said, only bundles of cash in suitcases. And Milan, what you are asking it has the same answer because what prevailed before was not just mining companies, but also terrorists, also criminals, also drug smugglers, giving huge sums in bundles of money. And this Rajiv is aware of, we have worked together on this. So it was not a better situation. Now you are, you're focusing on the issue of whether there is full transparency. Obviously, when you're not disclosing the names, we have only come halfway forward, but that halfway is a very major step forward because whether you are a mining company or you're an information technology company or you are the Tatas, all of which are contributing by buying these electoral bonds, these are legitimate funds. These are tax paid funds. These are uh, under the scanner of, as I said, regulatory authorities. So yes, let the, the topic of this debate is, is this a step forward? It is a major step forward. Does it meet all the all the wish lists that Rajiv and I would like to have? No, and that's that's a fight for another day. But it is a major step forward in having legitimate funds in politics. Let me just ask one quick follow up uh, on that, Mr. Pond, and then I'll tr and I'll have a question for Professor Gouda. Uh, in defending the bonds, the late finance minister Arun Jaitley said in 2017, I just want to quote what he said. People donating to a political party usually do not like to disclose their identity as they fear repercussions from rival political parties. By purchasing electoral bonds, they can keep their identity secret. Spe now, the question, that's, that's the full quote. The, the question I have is, uh, it's perfectly fine and natural for special interests to desire anonymity, but why should the government be in the business of accommodating and legitimizing those demands? So I answered this uh, in my opening statement as well as in the earlier question, because there was no traceability or legitimacy in the earlier situation. Now there is legitimacy of the money and you're right, it doesn't go full step forward in, in having the disclosure of the names. Uh, but the reality is, I also refer to this in my opening statement, that we had a culture of half a century of, uh, of penalizing, of extortion, of all kinds of harassment for people who came forward and donated. So even legitimate companies with great track records uh, have this hesitation. We need to change the culture. The first step is one side of the coin. If the money is legitimate, it comes from registered entities under the scanner of authorities, regulatory authorities, rather than by smugglers and terrorists and criminals. It's a huge step forward. And as I said, it may not meet the full requirement, but it is a huge step forward. Uh, Mr. Gada, would you like to respond to uh, the statements which Mr. Panda has put forward in response to the questions? Yeah, sure. First of all, he certainly knows that in the past, there were absolutely legitimate methods of, build, of making contributions. You could make contributions through checks. You could, in fact, have those contributions be deducted from your taxes. So it's not as if the avenue was not there industrialists and whoever else donated money chose not to use those avenues and instead chose to well you know would donate those uh, suitcases of cash as as you pointed out but the basic thing is why, why what is the situation here anyone can go out there and set up a shell company and use that shell company to uh, to set up a bank account to fund uh, funnel money into that bank account and essentially at the end of it you uh, buy the bearer bonds the uh, electoral bonds give them to whoever else you want who makes the contribution these can be as extorted as any other you know, cash earlier so the, there's nothing that keeps criminals from extorting companies uh, who actually go out there and make these purchases so fundamentally this actually does nothing it only increases opacity because earlier you know to the extent that companies had to be profitable have seven and a half percent um uh, you know that's the maximum they could donate and then they had to have um how what, what else were the requirements they basically they were required to also report this you know, to the income tax authorities now all of those requirements are gone 
a company that makes the donation does not have to report this to the income tax authorities. A political party does not have to uh, make these, uh, other than just the total, it does not have to really uh, account for this either. So in this sort of a situation, we are all much worse off. And, you know, so basically all this does, essentially, it's, it just prevents us from understanding who's been extorted by the ruling party who in, and who's been forced to uh, give their contributions through electoral bonds. That's where the situation is. It's a terrible move. Yeah. Mr. Panda, I, I will give you a chance to respond. Let me just follow up with one question to Professor Gauda. Uh, according to your own party's disclosures uh, to the Election Commission of India, 42% of the Congress party's contributions in fiscal year 2018-19 came from electoral bonds. Uh, does this reliance from your own party on bonds undermine the very arguments that you're trying to make? Uh, not at all, Milan. We, uh, I have opposed electoral bonds from the moment they were introduced. And the, our party itself, you see, all political parties asked the government for more information. And the government did not consult us. It went ahead and introduced, uh, implemented the electoral bond scheme. And then, basically, what are we left with? We're left with a faith accompli. If the, here is a method that is legal as of now, and um, uh, if, if there is a legal channel and we're getting that money, we're not going to reject it. Everyone is, you know, given how little we get compared to the ruling party. And so basically, this is not something that we enjoy taking, but we're not going to reject it. It doesn't undermine my argument at all. We want to improve the system. And this is not an improvement in the system. Uh, Mr. Panda, would you like to respond to anything Professor Gaud has just said? Yes, my friend Rajiv is being extremely disingenuous. Uh, you know, when he says shell companies, let's keep in mind, India had more than 2,500 registered political parties. Most of them were completely inactive and they were shells for laundering this kind of unaccountable cash which came in suitcases and bundles. Uh, and because of this new system, Legitimate parties have a much uh, better chance of, of funding themselves. Secondly, even for legitimate parties, uh, they, they we used to report only a small amount of the funding because it was all in cash. So that improves. Thirdly, you know, uh, thousands of shell companies have been shut down by this government, not related to politics, but in general. And these thousands of uh, so-called political parties are collapsing because of this new system. That's a great thing that is happening. And, you know, uh, the, when, when the Congress gets more than 40% of its funding from these bonds, uh, many would say that that is actually more than what should be expected, considering how the Congress has slid in popular support in the last uh, many years. Uh, and he's not right when he says that in the past there were methods of, of legitimate donations. The Center for Media Studies in Delhi has pointed out that in the last election before the electoral bonds, they estimated that $5 billion was spent out of which only $1 billion were reported. So four out of $5 billion was entirely cash from very unsavory sources. Uh, Mr. Pandey, let me just uh, pose a follow-up question to you. You know, one of the central arguments you're making is that although bonds don't go 100% to full transparency, they at least move the ball forward in that Funds are now flowing through legitimate banking channels and you have regulatory norms, uh, know your client, KYC restrictions, and so on and so forth. However, we now know from RTI information that the uh, newspaper reporter Nitin Sethi has uncovered that the government ignored the expert advice of both the Election Commission and the Reserve Bank, both of which argued that the bonds could potentially open up political funding to shell companies, to foreign money, to corrupt money. So therefore, if these two apex institutions, and I think you'd agree with me that both of them have considerable credibility, or at least have had, uh, shouldn't these warnings tell us something that uh, you could say all you want about KYC norms at the end of the day, there are enough loopholes in the banking system for uh, bad money to enter in? No, I would... Uh urge you to and all the all the viewers here to carefully go into what the RBI had said uh, and what the election commission had said. You're right. They're indeed very respected institutions. 
What they have said is that it would be ideal if you also had declaration of the names of the donors and that's what they would support. That's what Rajiv has supported and even I have supported in the past. But that doesn't mean this is not a step forward. Anybody that says that electoral bonds is not a step forward basically says that the status quo which existed, which was bundles of cash in suitcases, not just by corporates, but by all these unsavory characters was better. It's not better. This is definitely better. And uh, you know, there's no getting away from that. Now, the, the, the title of this debate is, do electoral bonds represent a move forward for transparency and legitimacy of the funds? I, I humbly appeal to you, there is no getting away from the fact that it is a huge step forward. Now, about uh, influ you know, you're talking about people having influence because they buy bonds. You think that was not happening in the old system by donating cash and by people who could never get through a KYC certification. So this is a huge improvement. Professor Gauda, there have been numerous other moves that have happened in parallel with electoral bonds. You mentioned at least two of them. The first is that uh, the cap on corporate giving, which previously stood at 7.5% of, of a corporation's average net profits over the previous three years, that's been dropped. Uh, second is that the provision that firms must declare their political contributions on their annual profit and loss statements in an itemized way, uh, that has been dropped. But there was a third measure, uh, which has also been introduced. In 2014, the Delhi High Court issued an order that found both the BJP and the Congress guilty of accepting donations from foreign companies. And in 2016, the then union finance minister introduced language in that year's finance bill to retroactively amend the 2010 FCRA law to redefine what a foreign company was, thereby getting both the BJP and the Congress off the hook. Uh, this move made it legal for companies previously identified as foreign to donate openly to Indian political parties. Hasn't your party, in going along with this, contributed to this atmosphere of opacity? That specific instance is one where a particular company, which everyone believed to be an Indian company, turned out to be headquartered in London and therefore qualified as a foreign company when, you know, fundamentally its activities are all here. And um, so both parties essentially came together and said, OK, this is um, uh, you know, if, if you do not essentially legalize this contribution, which was taken in good faith, you would end up in a situation where both parties would need to be disqualified. OK, and that's uh, that would be a very drastic uh, decision for act what was a genuine mistake. So so essentially that uh, particular instance we saw uh, we went along with the government's proposal to to amend the uh, foreign contribution regulation act um, uh, related uh, aspects of the of, of the um, of electoral donations so that was a very specific instance but um, you know let me address some of the other points that um, my friend mr j panda has been um, emphasizing just take the two words transparency and legitimacy what does transparency mean to a common man, to me and you. It means it means something else to Jay Panda. The basic point about transparency is that you need to know, you need to be able to follow the money. You need to be, don't know who contributed money and what they got in return. This is a fundamental requirement in any functioning democracy for using the term transparency. Instead, what we have here is we have a huge amount, 95% of, uh, you know, 6,000 crores going to the BJP. And we have no idea who gave that money. We know that they were cronies. They were fat cats. They could have been very much the, uh, you know, the dubious characters that Jay seems to go out with. He seems to know them so well. But the basic point is that you write about them, Milan. I mean, so I, I'm, I'm staying away from that crowd. Uh, but basically, the point is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, essentially, we have a situation here where we have no idea who are these people and what they've contributed. We know that the 95%, 97% are more than one crore. So these are big contributors. These are not your know, small uh, contributors, which would have been an improvement in the system. So here you have a whole bunch of rich people being so generous and giving to the ruling party. Why? Because of the generosity of their heart. 
I'm sorry, that's not the nature of the Indian businessman. And the basic point is something very significant in the form of quid pro quo is, in, uh, is at work here. And that is something you and I won't know because the system is not transparent. On the term legitimacy, I'll take you back to demonetization. When demonetization, that brilliant economic move was brought in by Prime Minister Modi, what was the argument? that there was a lot of black money sloshing around in the country and that if you demonetize that you won't be able to that you'll be able to keep out some thousands of crores or thousands of lakhs of crores of cash unaccounted for cash and it would not come back into the ba banking system what did we find when eventually the rbi got done with counting the money we found that 99 percent of the money came back or yeah, the cash came back and got converted through the banking system then what was the need for demonetization if there's no black money out there in the world outside? The basic point is the banking system as a channel is corrupt. The banking system is manipulable. And what you see in terms of uh, uh, yeah, electoral bonds, this whole notion that white money is coming in is something that has to be rejected. And the idea, uh, uh, Nitin Sethi's investigations, which came out in the Huffington Post, clearly pointed out that the State Bank of India is keeping track of every electoral bond and who purchased it. And who owns the State Bank of India? Who can get uh, who can get to influence the State Bank of India to provide that information about donors? The ruling party. And therefore, this is not a fair, legitimate, or transparent system. And unfortunately, uh, you know, Mr. J. Wanda is laughing his way to the bank. The people of India are saying, what the hell have we got stuck with? Mr. Panda, uh, we are about to turn to audience Q&A, but I will give you um, two minutes if you would like to respond to what Mr. Gowda has just said. Uh, you know, the fact is, the title of this debate is not whether we have reached a utopia where everything is hunky-dory. The title is whether we have these electoral bonds represent a step forward in transparency and legitimacy. And the answer is, when you have corporates registered in India who are under the scanner of the Reserve Bank of India, they're under the scanner of SEBI, which is the equivalent of SEC, they're under the scanner of the registrar of companies. It is a much better situation than, for example, in the past, we had people like Dawood Ibrahim, a very well-known Indian gangster and terrorist who lives in Pakistan, and it is well known that he was funding politicians. So this is a dramatic improvement because somebody like that does not clear the KYC norms anymore. Now, uh, Rajiv tried to divert the discussion into demonetization. Uh, there isn't time to go into that. I have spoken about that extensively. You can look up. Uh, it, it is not relevant to this issue. What is relevant is that we may not have the names of the donors, and ideally that should be a reform that should happen in the future, and there should be more, uh, uh, more support for that. Even the donors themselves are hesitant because of the culture of the last 50 years that I talked about. But the fact is, uh, the donors are all under the Indian system and India's banking system does have a lot of problems. There are many problems India has inherited over many decades, but the reality is there are dramatic improvements that are taking place. The KYC norms, the State Bank of India, which monitors this particular scheme for KYC is the largest bank in India. There are hundreds of millions of Indians today. We have the world's largest biometric identification program, which is linked to these many of these KYC norms to just dismiss them and be, uh, you know, to denigrate them like that is, does not behoove Rajiv, uh, who has separately supported many of these other related reforms that are taking place. So this does, re in fact, uh, represent a huge step forward, not backward. Let me, let's go to the audience questions now, because we have about 25 minutes left in this debate, and I want to make sure that we, we have spent at least 20 minutes before giving you a chance for your closing statements. Let me go to the question for, uh, which originated from someone named P. Milland. Um, if electoral bonds are anonymous to prevent witch hunting, that is, retaliating against corporates who have donated, how do we prevent uh, or protect against a quid pro quo towards the party in power or, or protect against one party dominating power? Uh, this question I'll put to you, Mr. Panda. I mean, uh, it's fine and well to say that, well, you know, we couldn't do that under the other system either. Uh, but why is it that this government wants to adopt the terrible old system and just say, well, we, we're not going to push that far, but we want to claim success on elect election finance reform. 
There's a genuine question there, but that was not a fair wording of it. We have not adopted the bad system of the past. As I repeatedly have said, uh, a system where bonds are monitored by the regulatory authorities of the country is far better than suitcases of cash. Remember, in the mid-1990s, there was a very infamous uh, stock market scandal. When the accused was arrested, he openly boasted that he had taken suitcases of cash to the then uh, prime minister of India at his home. So this is a far better situation than that. And the answer to your question is, the fact that the BJP only gets a little over 60% of its funding from the electoral bonds, and the Congress, which has been decimated, I mean, the Congress has come down to a tenth of the kind of number of uh, seats it had in Parliament, gets more than 40% of its funding from electoral bonds, should answer your question that uh, indeed it is, you know, there is no, uh, there's no witch hunting, there is no pressurization, and that the system, the initial first three years show that it is working well. So here's a question I'll ask to you first, Shay, and then I'll ask to, to Professor Gauda. It comes from uh, someone named Sandeep Suresh. Uh, would you agree or support a new amendment to the law on electoral bonds that would require political parties to submit the details of donors and amounts in a sealed cover to the Election Commission of India? So even if there were not public disclosure, uh, would you accept some level of check or scrutiny by the Election Commission of India? I'll ask you that first, Mr. Panda, and then you, Professor Gowda. I, I don't want to get committed to any such uh, party position without this being discussed extensively in the party. Now, both Rajiv and I have asked and, and actually worked for a lot of reform. The Election Commission is highly respected, so much so that not just in India, other countries have been asking the Election Commission to go and help them conduct elections. And it needs teeth. You know, today, the Election Commission uh, has, has limitations in what it can do. It can disqualify candidates, but there are limitations in terms of the accounts and so on and so forth. So before we go about these sealed covers, we know that sealed covers can often lead to, to leaks. The fact that even opposition parties which have been decimated are getting substantial sums through these EBs, electoral bonds, means that we have had a good start in the past three years. Let us have this cultural change where people accept that donating bundles of cash is no longer uh, is a good thing and is not required anymore, is not happening anymore. Then we can go forward on this path to reform and have even more transparency and legitimacy. Professor Gada, would you support um, this kind of a move, which would at least give the Election Commission some kind of window into the transaction level details of electoral bonds? I cannot uh, speak for my party, just like Jay cannot speak for his party without uh, consultations. But we have in our manifesto pointed out that we would abolish the electoral bond system because we think that it violates transparency, fairness, and legitimacy. So the basic point is this uh, question doesn't even arise as far as we're concerned. We want to get the, this, get this whole retrograde system out of the window. We don't want it. And, um, and the word retrograde I'm using here, because that's the word that's been used by the Election Commission, used by the Reserve Bank of India, because this is seen as a move, as a major step backward. Now, when we talk about um, things improving, actually think about how much money is still spent in elections in India today, right? Even this amount of 60%, 40%, whatever has been quoted here, refers to known sources. Not both political parties, or all political parties, receive a huge amount of money from you know, unknown sources, as they're called because they're usually people who are volunteering and offering small amounts of cash. And uh, the vast majority of contributions to both political parties tend to come in that form. And that continues to be the case even today. Some parties like the BSP earn 100% of the money through that particular method. Now, um, <clears throat> when you think about um, the actual amount that's spent in elections and spent very substantially by the one party that has not yet been decimated, but we will decimate in the next election, the BJP, you will see that the amount of money that is spent is so humongous that what is reported has no connection to the actual amount spent by the BJP. So fundamentally, you know, you have a system that is terrible out there. And the system that's been put in place today is one where if people are going to the vice president of the BJP's home and giving him suitcases of electoral bonds, you and I won't know, because that's how the system is designed to keep you and me and the people of India ignorant 
about how the system is favoring the ruling party and about what the ruling party, what forest it is making open to somebody, what airports it's making open to somebody else, what you know, what uh, other public sector undertakings are being destroyed to favor which crony capitalist, or you know, what defense deal has been cut with which bankrupt industrialist, all these sorts of things you and I won't know because that's the modus operandi under the name of transparency. And this is a terrible, terrible move. And I'm uh, you know, really shocked that someone like Jay Fonda, would, would, who talked about electoral reform, would, uh, would go ahead and support something which is a deform, which is so dramatically negative to the Indian political system's evolution. So, Professor Gauda, let me push you on one thing. So, you know, we, we talked earlier about um, uh, whether you would support giving some enhanced uh, scrutiny power to the Election Commission. Let me ask you about another question which has come, which is the following. Will the digitation, digital, digital, sorry, digitalization of bonds, sorry, that's a mouthful, and the registration of donors using KYC using, say, a central entity like the National Payments Corporation of India, the NCPI, would that be a better step for improving transparency in the bond scheme? See, you wouldn't need one. You could have given that money through checks. You could have done the same thing, right? You would know who gave money to whom. Here, who bought the bonds, and um, a bond would have a digital record, and it would be recorded in the, uh, you know, in the party's uh, accounts that received it. So, you, you know, there are other methods. You didn't need to create this whole charade. The basic point is that in the moment you say you're going to name donors, then it um, militates against the original logic of the electoral bond scheme, which is that people, are, or industrialists, didn't want to be uh, their identities to be revealed because of uh, the fear of retribution. This was the argument Mr. Jaitley made. And, um, and there's some truth that, you know, uh, let me point out that, uh, you know, in our, uh, when we were in office, other political parties had no difficulty raising funds because we, uh, you know, we, we were not in the business of being uh, vindictive towards anybody who contributed to any, any, any other political party. So, so let me, uh, I, I don't, yeah. Let okay. me pose a, a question. We're picking a couple of things which have come from the comments and, and a question I wanted to ask related to Mr. Panda. So, Let's just accept for a second your arguments about electoral bonds representing a half step forward, okay? Let's just set that aside and say we all agree. Uh, what the investigations into bonds by Nitin Sethi and others have shown is that the government, even under the terms the bonds were framed, under regulation, have been violated. So for instance, uh, the government intervened to order the SBI to open up a special window for the 2018 Karnatic elections. That was not pre-specified. Uh, even though bonds are time limited and are supposed to expire after a certain period of time, the finance ministry asked the SBI to allow for the use of bonds in Karnataka even after those bonds have expired. So even if you accept your claims about a step forward, uh, if it weren't for this investigation, no one would be the wiser about how the executive is actually flouting both the letter and the spirit of the law. How would you respond to those allegations? Milan, that's a great question. And it's a legitimate question. And let me answer that. So that happened within the first year of the electoral bond scheme being announced. And there were some initial teething troubles. And I'll tell you what the teething trouble was. Now, as you know, we have far too many elections in India because of the lack of, uh, of uh, uh, synchronicity between state and, and national elections. So we, you know, we virtually have elections every quarter or every four months. And when the, the, the time periods for these electoral bonds were set for four times during the year, and it was out of sync with the Karnataka election in the very first cycle. And it was not just the government, the BJP government, which asked for it, for your information, my, my friend and uh, opponent in this debate, Rajiv Gowda's party, the Congress party, also asked for it because of the initial lack of synchronicity between the, the windows in which you could buy the electoral bonds and the elections happening in Karnataka. It was very explicitly written by the government of India as an exception. It was supported by the main opposition party. And uh, that's understandable because of the teething troubles. Now we have, a, you know, separately I have argued about streamlining the electoral system to something similar like the US system, having one cycle with the general election and another cycle of state elections in the midterm. Until we do that, 
we, that's a different issue altogether. But it was a legitimate question, and, and I believe uh, that it was necessary to do that in the beginning. It, it's not required to be done anymore because the system has fallen into uh, uh, into the pattern that where you see that there is uh, no discrimination. I just want to say one more thing. You know, when my friend Rajiv says that they would uh, turn back, uh, you know, they would they would cancel the system. Essentially, it would go back to suitcases of cash and people like Dawood Ibrahim contributing money. That's not something we want. We will never support that. And can there be more reforms? You asked him. I will answer. Of course, there can be a wish list of many things that could and should be done, and we should discuss that in coming years. Let me put a final question to Rajiv Gowda before we allow you to make closing statements. Um, and this is something which comes from at least three questions I can pick up in the chat. Um, Professor Gauda, your party was in power from 2004 to 2014 most recently. Um, and many people have pointed out that when you had your time, uh, you did not, your party did not make meaningful steps towards improving transparency. So if we all agree for a second that bonds are a step backwards, as you have comp uh, repeatedly said, what are the steps forward? What would the Congress party affirmatively like to see done as opposed to just criticize what this present government has done? First, it's a mistake to say that we didn't improve the system. We certainly did. One of the things that we did was we changed the limit of election spending that was uh, allowed. And we tried to make it more uh, connect, connected to reality. And that's one thing that we did. We also experimented with the concept of electoral trusts, where contributions would be made to an organization, which would then go ahead and make contributions to political parties. And that way, there was a certain element of transparency that was brought in. And so, there, there, so there absolutely, um, you know, that's uh, so there were uh, certainly improvements in the system that, that we brought in. But take a look at our manifesto. And there, we very clearly point out that we favor the setting up of a national election fund. We favor, and I have written extensively on the idea of public funding of elections. We don't even call it state funding. We want the public to be owners of the money that is contributed. And I personally have even advocated the establishment of something called a voter bond where each voter in this country is given essentially the, uh, a bond or you know, a contribution of 100 rupees, which he or she can make to the political party of their choice, to the candidate of their choice. That, you know, and, and that becomes a way to break out of this reliance on crony capitalists and on the Dawood Ibrahims, who uh, JC used to know something so much about and um, and basically open up the process to something that harks back to the old Congress system of Charana memberships, the uh, you know Mahatma Gandhi's style of raising money from the common people. That's really what I would like to see the system move towards, and I would like to see the National Election Fund having certain other aspects to it. For example, some portion of it should be allotted to um, uh, to parties on the basis of the historic performance. But another portion should be a matching grant, uh, just like the United States has some elements of this, to, uh, uh, to, to candidates and parties that can demonstrate a certain amount of contributions and support from, um, from a wide cross section of their of their voters you know something like this will get us out of the kind of morass the kind of hellhole that we've got our political system uh, stuck in and that's something that we idealistically would like to move forward towards uh, we have about one more minute. So, uh, Mr. Panda, let me just give you a quick final question and then we'll move to Rajiv for his his closing statement. Um, you know, you have said that, uh, and Mr. Jaitley has said that part of the reason electoral bonds were necessary, again, is because anonymity in a, in a context, a political economy context like India, if you're a corporation or a firm that fears retaliation, um, is necessary. Uh, and that people, frankly, had gotten used to that over the past 50 or 60 years. Now, if that's your diagnosis, isn't the solution then to stop the retaliation against corporations and get at the political regulatory nexus that makes it so hard for firms. So rather than saying, okay, special interests, they don't wanna disclose, let's, let's give them an avenue. 
why don't you get to the root of the problem, which is really that people are fearful that if they speak out against Mr. Modi or the ruling party, that they are going to be whacked down. If, if uh, donors were fearful, they would would not have contributed to more than 40% of the Congress funds through electoral bonds. So but that's but just 40% not, of a very small number, 40% of a very small number yeah. compared to the BJP. <laughs> Considering that the Congress representation in parliament came down dramatically by 70% or more or 80%, uh, you know, many would say that is very generous actually. But let me, let me answer the question. You are comparing apples and oranges. The anonymity of the earlier regime and by the way, this regime was created entirely by Rajiv's party when in 1969 they changed the rules and shoved the entire funding system under the carpet. Uh, the, uh, the, the anonymity there was, there was no KYC for those people. They were not registered entities. They didn't come under uh, many, many other aspects of uh, regulatory authorities. As I said, it was bundles of cash in suitcases from very unsavory people. That has changed. Rajiv talked about the electoral trust scheme, which the Congress UPA government uh, instituted in 2013, please look into it. It is extremely opaque and it was indeed a retrograde grade step, which has been reversed with this uh, electoral bond scheme. Now, one final thing, uh, Raji was trying to have his cake and eat it too when he tried to bring in demonetization. On the one hand, he said demonetization took cash out and put it into the banks. And then he keeps insisting that even today, the, uh, the huge amount of cash is there in the political parties uh, funding. Now that doesn't make sense because the cash has gone out of the system dramatically and you can have a different argument about the economics of it. There's another major change that happened along with electoral bonds. Earlier to that, you could make cash donations of 20,000 rupees without any reporting. So you saw lots and lots and lots of 19,900 rupee donations, which was the illicit money that I've been talking about. Now that's come down to a maximum of 2000 rupees. Now, when you try to justify huge amounts of donations at less than 2000 each, it is that much more difficult. So that is another step forward that has happened. Uh, 2000 rupee notes were not printed in the last one year in the country. This was a news item just two days ago. So it's not true that cash has that degree of dominance that it used to have in political funding. So, you know, let's, let's be accurate about these issues. Okay, we are very short on time. So let me now turn it to Professor Gauda. Uh, you went second in the opening round. So let me give you the opportunity to go first. You have about two and a half minutes. Uh, I'd ask you to please respect the time limit by presenting your closing statement as the participants get ready to vote again at the end of this. What would your closing statement to them be? I think we should look at the track record what has actually happened after electoral bonds have been introduced. You have a situation where electoral bonds have uh, managed to generate a lot of money for political parties. 95% of these electoral bonds have gone to the ruling party, Janata Party. Out of these overall electoral bonds that have been contributed, 97% are one crore or above in contributions. There are smaller denominations possible, but the contributions have all been bought in the denomination of one crore above. And if you take 10 lakhs and one crore and put them together, you have 99.7% of donations. So what you have seen is that some very wealthy people have been either voluntarily or forcibly contributing money in huge chunks to the ruling party. And you do not know who they are and what they're getting in return. This is the textbook definition of opacity. And therefore, any move that suggests that this is supposed to be a move towards transparency is the very definition of double speak. So fundamentally, this is not a measure that makes any sense. What we need is a new imagination in terms of thinking about how to bring about change, bring about political reform, how to ensure that transparency is brought about in very, very different ways, and how to ensure that the people of India can be owners of the political system and not the crony capitalists, not the criminals that you've written about. And basically, we need a national election fund, we need voter bonds, we need a new set of approaches 
that will ensure that every citizen of India, every voter, owns the system and does not let it be sold to the highest bidder, which is what has happened under this system, and in a manner where the ruling party is able to extort, able to get corner the resources, and you and I are none the wiser about how the country is being sold down the, down the river as we speak. Thank okay, you. thank you, Professor Gada. Professor Panda, uh, I give you now two minutes to make your closing remarks. Okay, now um, I would once again very humbly ask all the viewers to uh, recognize that we are not talking about whether we have a perfect situation today. We are talking about the title of this debate is Have the Electoral Bonds Contributed to an Improvement of Legitimacy and Transparency of Political Funds? Now, Rajiv just talked about very wealthy people uh, either coerced or otherwise buying bonds. Uh, the fact is uh, there is no coercion. Otherwise, Congress would not be getting uh, electoral bonds. Not only that, if you think that's very small, uh, Congress has been winning uh, some elections in some states. And uh, they didn't do that on love and fresh air. They spent money. They collected money. Uh, keep in mind that I would much rather have people in India, wealthy or otherwise, contribute to elections rather than the, the likes of terrorists and, and drug smugglers and blatantly criminal elements, which was happening with cash in suitcases, which is dramatically reduced today. Keep in mind the 2,500 political parties registered, which were basically schemes for money laundering because there was, you know, absolutely cannot touch any political funding. It was an untouchable uh, situation. Uh, whereas the really active political parties are a couple of dozen or a few dozen in the country. These political parties are continuing to get funding through this new system maybe differently depending on their popularity or their prospects of winning. But certainly the vast majority of the 2,500 companies are not going to get electoral bonds and they will get squeezed out of the system, which is an excellent thing in my point of view. Uh, I would humbly then suggest that yes, there can be many items on the wish list about further reforms in coming years, but the electoral bonds do in fact represent a big step forward in the legitimacy and transparency of, of political money in India. Thank you, Mr. Panda. We will now go to the audience to take a final poll. Um, have electoral bonds ushered in an era of transparency and political funding in India? 20% of you said, 21% of you said yes, 79% said no. Um, please take the poll now so that we can see where we've ended up. Shaheen, do you have the results in? Um, yes, Milan. So uh, we have the results of the poll in. Um, it is 68% uh, voting um, no and 32% voting yes. OK. So the, 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 the yes I didn't hear. That went up by about, go ahead. I, I couldn't hear the results. So just to repeat, the, so just to repeat the results of the poll, we have 32% um, voting yes and 68% voting no. Okay, thank you. Over to you, Shaheen. Thank you. As we conclude, we'll um, just like to express our gratitude to both our speakers, Mr. Rajiv Gauda and Mr. Jay Panda. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your thoughts on the very, very important subject of election finance. 
a big thank you to our moderator, Milan Vaishnav, for putting so much thought and preparation into helping us uncover both sides of um, what seems like a fairly contentious topic. And finally, thank you so much to our audiences in India and the United States and elsewhere that tuned into our event um, and asked probing questions. So we'll be back in two weeks with a second debate on the changing geopolitical environment in India and its impact on the startup ecosystem. We'll have with us Anand Daniel of Axel Partners, among Bedi of Daily Hunt, and Rohan Dharmakumar of the Ken, debate whether the recent startup ban and strict capital controls will be a headwind or a tailwind for the country's booming startup ecosystem. So thank you so much again for joining us, and we look forward to meeting you again. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gada. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Shaheen. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you, Milan. Thank you, Shaheen, and all the organizers. Good to see you, Jay. Thank you.